everyone, welcome back to the channel. In today's video, we are going to dive into one of the most important and also one of the most challenging areas of fluid dynamics, turbulent flow modeling. Turbulence is everywhere, in the wake behind an aircraft, inside pipelines, and even in the air around us. But because turbulence involves chaotic, three-dimensional, and time-dependent motion, it's not practical to simulate every detail in most engineering applications. That's where turbulence models come in. In this video, I will introduce the idea of turbulence modeling in computational fluid dynamics. Then we will focus on one of the most widely used models, the k-epsilon model. We will talk about what the two variables k and epsilon represent, why this model is so popular in engineering simulations, and some of its strengths and limitations. By the end of this video, you will have a clear picture of how the k-epsilon model helps engineers and researchers approximate turbulence in real-world problems. Ready? So let's get started. Osborne Reynolds conducted an experiment by injecting dye into a pipe flow. The injected dye diffused into the flow in a straight line, showing that the fluid is flowing in smooth layers. This type of regime is called laminar flow. Then, velocity was increased. As velocity increased, some fluctuations were observed. This flow is called transitional flow. As increasing velocity continued, fluid start to move in chaotic ways. This type of flow is called turbulent flow. To determine which type of flow we are studying, we need Reynolds number. And to estimate Reynolds number, you use density, velocity, characteristic length, and viscosity. What, what is characteristic length? Well, based on your geometry, Characteristic length is defined differently. For example, for an annular flow, it's hydraulic diameter. For a flat plate, it's plate length. For a sphere, it's diameter. And for an airfoil, it's cord length. As you can see, for problems with different geometries, the critical range of Reynolds number separating laminar and turbulent flow varies. As velocity increases, Reynolds number increases too, and the flow becomes turbulent. So, High speed is one of the factors affecting our flow. Other things like geometry, for example, roughness of surface, can also affect flow. Then, fluid starts to swirl, mix, and move in chaotic waves. This swirl, let's call them eddies. To capture the tiniest eddies in a flow, is impossible for engineering sized problem. Okay, so what we do? We use modeling. So there are three approaches for modeling turbulent flow. The easiest one is RANS. It is for Reynolds Average Navier Stokes. As its name says, we average velocity. As you can see, we have just a straight line. It's an averaged velocity. Then we have LES. Ah, in LES, 
we model some eddies, we resolve the other ones. Which ones? Large ones. Large eddy simulation, LES. And then we have DNS. In DNS, you resolve all eddies. All of them. You can capture all of them. So, it, as it seems, it's very accurate. You can see in the picture. While RANS is the least accurate one. But computational cost for DNS is high, while for RANS, not so much. As I said, we have large eddies, which are far from the wall, and small eddies, usually near the wall. Large eddies divide into smaller eddies, then those smaller eddies divide into a smaller ones and so on. And at the end, the smallest eddies dissipate through heat energy. This is called energy cascade. In a DNS model, as I said, we resolve all of the eddies. So our mesh is really fine. But, well, computationally costly and expensive. In LES, large eddy simulation, we can capture large eddies, but we model small eddies. And in RANS, we model. So by modeling, we mean that we take into consideration their effect. We do not model the eddies themselves. No, we take their effect into consideration. As I said, there are three approaches for modeling turbulent flow. RANS, Reynolds Average Navier-Stokes, LES, Large Eddy Simulations, and DNS, Direct Numerical Simulations. RANS approach is applied on cases using different models. There are even some hybrid models such as DES or SAS, a combination of RANS and LES. All these models are available in ANSYS Fluent, but today our focus is on K epsilon. K epsilon uses a RANS approach, meaning it uses average values. Velocity is defined an average value plus fluctuations. When you input this definition of velocity into Navier-Stokes equation, an extra term appears. This term call, is called Reynolds stress. And it is unknown to us. So we need to rewrite it in terms and parameters that are known or achievable for us. We use Businesk hypothesis. To rewrite the term. In Businesk hypothesis, there is a parameter mu a t called eddy viscosity or turbulent viscosity, and it is achieved through density times c mu times k squared divided by epsilon. Now we need to have k and epsilon kinetic energy and dissipation rate. We use transport equation to write equations for kinetic energy and dissipation energy. Know that for different types of K-epsilon model, RNG, realizable, and standard, K equation is the same. It's the epsilon equation that varies. In both equations, there are terms of source and sinks. They could be due to the production of mean velocity shear, production due to buoyancy, or user-defined sources. In K equation, there's a negative term that is dissipation. In epsilon equation, there are model constants that their value are as presented. 
The plot shows turbulent energy spectrum or Kolmogorov energy cascade. It shows that large eddies, they have a lot of kinetic energy and as they cascade into smaller eddies, they lose their energy, they become smaller and at the end they dissipate into heat. Smaller eddies have larger wave numbers while large eddies have small wave numbers. And in the inertial subrange, the slope of the line is kappa in the power of minus five third. In a turbulent regime, there are two main layers, an outer layer that is turbulent layer, where turbulent forces are dominant, and then an inner layer that is composed of three sublayers, overlap layer, buffer layer, and viscous sublayer. In overlap and buffer layer, some viscous forces are observed, but they are weak. In viscous sublayer, viscous forces are dominant and no turbulent forces are observed. So when you want to use K epsilon model to model viscous sublayer, you need to use damping functions because we get more dissipation of kinetic energy in that layer where viscous forces are dominant. But if you are modeling other parts such as turbulent layer, the outer layer, just use the standard K epsilon model. Low Reynolds version of K epsilon is for when viscous forces are dominant. So the turbulent Reynolds number shows the ratio of turbulent forces to viscous forces. And when it is low, it means viscous forces are dominant. And it happens in viscous sublayer when Y plus is less than five. So we need to reduce eddy viscosity or turbulent viscosity. We do it through damping functions. As you can see for FMU, when Reynolds is high, it approaches one. And when it is low near the wall, it approaches to a value less than one. And FMU is multiplied into the equation for mu at t. So it reduces eddy viscosity. As you can see, in the equation, when mu at t reduces, laminar viscosity dominates the diffusion term. And F1 and F2 are used accordingly for C1 and C2 in epsilon equation. There are three types of K epsilon models. The most famous one is standard K epsilon, best for simple, fully turbulent, attached flows with modest separations. Then we have RNG, better for flows with high strain rates, swirl, and moderate separations. Improved accuracy as low to moderate Reynolds number and realizable, often gives better prediction for flows with strong streamlined curvature, rotation, and separation. K epsilon model in ANSYS fluent. So if you are using a standard K epsilon model to simulate a turbulent flow, your near wall treatment options vary based on the layer that you are monitoring. So if you are monitoring viscous sublayer, your Y plus is less than five, you need to use enhanced wall treatment. If it's in buffer layer, your Y plus equals 11.225, scalable wall functions, but remember your results will have some inaccuracy. And if it's between 30 to 300, standard wall functions and non-equilibrium wall functions are for you.
if you have any questions about Y plus, watch our video on Y plus. If you found this video helpful, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you won't miss our next lesson. We'd also love to hear from you. If you have questions, suggestions, or topics you'd like us to cover, just leave a comment below. And if you'd like to connect with us directly, you can find all our links in the description box, including our website address and social media. Feel free to reach out anytime. Thanks for watching. See you in the next video.